This video is the second of a four-part series covering the components of GTO Check. In this video, we're going to provide an overview of the GTO Check Solver dashboard and an in-depth look at the charts at the first level. First, let's talk about the overall philosophy behind the structure and layout of this dashboard. As was mentioned in the first part of this video series, solvers calculate the strategies that maximize the average number of chips each player is expected to win over the long run, assuming that each player is doing his best to adjust against his opponent and win the most number of chips possible. When solvers were first publicly released around 2015, they caused a major sea change in the poker community, and as a result, strategies have improved significantly across the board. We no longer have to guess what the correct play is in a vacuum, we can easily obtain mathematically derived strategies that are proven to be effective. There is, however, one inherent flaw in the strategies calculated by solvers. In reality, solvers are not very sophisticated machines. They have only one function, to simulate a hand countless times over, with the sole objective being to follow the strategies that win the most chips over the long run. Solvers don't have any sort of formal strategy or system of play that we can learn from. They just identify the lines that make the most profit through brute force, and then they spit out the resulting data in the form of numbers. It's up to us humans to decipher what this data means so that we can apply it to our games in practice. And given that there are more possible scenarios in poker than there are atoms in the universe, this is an enormously complex task. So what we have done with GTO Check is we have taken years of solver work and research and devised a system that's designed to structure the solver's outputs in a manner that we believe is most conducive to learning the fundamental principles that drive these profit maximizing strategies. And the way we accomplish this is through a system of scalable simplification. That is, we start our analysis at the highest level of abstraction possible and we only move on to the more granular when doing so is necessary to improve our strategy significantly. So what do we mean by abstract and granular? Well, in order to understand this, we first need to step back and define what a range is and why it is important. Since poker is a game of incomplete information where each player's cards are dealt face down, in order for players to make rational decisions, they must assess the likelihood of their opponents holding certain cards. The collection of all possible hands a player is likely to have is called his range. This range is shaped by a player's actions at previous decision points and affected by new community cards. So for example, if in a cash game the hijack 3 bets the low jack, it would be unlikely that the hijack has a hand like 10 deuce offsuit or queen 3 offsuit, but it is very possible that the hijack would have aces or kings or ace king. And if the flop comes king, king, jack, there's a high probability that the hijack will have made a strong hand on this board, including overpairs, trips, full houses, and quads. And so when the low jack is deciding whether he should call a c-bet holding a marginal hand, like pocket sixes for example, he needs to think about the very real possibility that he may be behind. The way a strategic player does this is by assessing how the hijack's range of possible hands intersects with the board. And every player, even the most unsophisticated one, does this at some level. Even when you're playing against grandpa for pennies, he will know that certain boards favor the preflop aggressor and this will affect the decisions he makes. What differentiates the best players in the world is that they're able to make this type of assessment very accurately by deftly gauging the opponent's range of possible hands at each stage of the game. So when we are playing against a strong opponent who is making decisions based on our likely hands, in order to make his life difficult, we should be simultaneously also thinking about the possible hands in our range and how they want to play at each decision point because this exercise will help us disguise our actual holdings. And this is one of the reasons why you often hear the concept of balance being closely associated with GTO. When we balance our range by playing groups of hands with disparate strength similarly, it makes it very difficult for our opponent to put us on a particular holding or to figure out our overall strategy. And ultimately, poker is a game of subterfuge and deception, so this concept is critically important. For example, we've all played against old man coffee that never bluffs and only bets on the river for value. 
This player is easy to play against because his range and strategies are very transparent. We know he always has it, so we can easily overfold when he shoves the river. We can avoid playing like Old Man Coffee by always being conscious of our range and balancing it so that we can potentially have a variety of different holdings at any given time. However, the reality is that in real time, it's impossible to balance each combination in our range in any sort of precise manner. So the way we simplify this balancing process is that instead of trying to formulate a unique strategy for each individual hand, we craft overarching strategies that apply to groups of hands in our range, and sometimes we can even utilize the same strategy indiscriminately with all of the hands in our range, which greatly simplifies the game. For example, here is a GTO check report for a 6 max 100 big blind 3 bet pot, where the in position player is the aggressor. As described in the first part of this tutorial series, this report shows the average range frequencies for each player across all 1,755 strategically unique flops. So here we're looking at the hijack C betting strategy after 3 betting the low jack, and when we sort by flops where the hijack bets quarter pot most often, we see that there are a number of boards where the solver is betting essentially its entire range with this sizing. Each of these values and accompanying bars show what percentage of the player's range takes each action when playing optimally. So in this case, on a king-king-jack rainbow board, the optimal strategy is for the hijack to bet quarter pot 92.84% of the time, which for simplification purposes we can assume is 100% of the time. In other words, instead of trying to devise a strategy for each of the combinations that the hijack is actually dealt in this spot, 5-6 of hearts, or pocket tens, or ace-queen off, etc, etc, he can simply see bet all of these hands quarter pot on these dry king-high boards or paired Broadway boards, and his play will be in alignment with the optimal profit maximizing strategy. Thus, this type of abstraction greatly simplifies the game because it means that when we know the one optimal strategy for the entire range, we also automatically know the optimal strategy for each individual combination within the range as well. Of course, this type of abstraction won't always be possible. We can't just blindly play all of the different hands in our range the same way in every situation and just get away with it against most opponents. More often than not, different hands in our range will have drastically different incentives, which adds complexity to our strategies. For example, let's instead find a flop where the hijack is doing a lot of mixing, such as this 8-7-6 rainbow board. On this type of board, certain hands in the hijack's range will have a strong incentive to bet, such as the nut straight that wants to begin building a pot. Other hands, like King-7 of clubs, don't really want to start blasting off on this board and would rather try to get to later streets or showdown. However, it is impossible to know or devise a unique strategy like this for each of the combinations in a player's range across scenarios. So what are we supposed to do? We can't simplify things and play our entire range the same way in a spot like this, but at the same time we can't craft a unique strategy for each single combination in our range either because that is not humanly possible. This is where GTO Check's philosophy of systematic simplification comes into play. That is, even if we can't simplify things by playing our entire range the same way, we can still utilize abstractions so that we can play groups of hands within our range the same way. This technique is called bucketing, and I've made a separate video covering this topic which I will link in the description below. Essentially, bucketing just means that we create a class of hands with similar strength attributes and play them the same way, instead of trying to individually reason about each combination that's within the class. So for example, this board generally favors the low jack caller because his range of likely hands is smashing this board with straights, sets, and two pairs. So we generally don't want to build up a big pot, particularly with our middling hands. But instead of trying to devise a unique strategy for each of our middling hands like ace seven of clubs or king eight of diamonds, we can just bucket them all together and play them the same way by checking the flop and this strategy will be generally consistent with the optimal strategy for each individual combination within this class. 
And this encapsulates the central thesis of the GTL Check Solver dashboard. It is a system of cross-filtering charts which allows us to slice and dice a player's range to generate custom classes of hands with varying levels of abstraction and objectively measure whether grouping such hands in this manner retains fidelity to the optimal solution. The default state of the dashboard is unfiltered, which means it's showing data for all of the hands within both players' ranges. However, chart by chart, we can start to apply filters that break down these ranges across various categories, such as by their equity or EV, by hand segments, by the presence or absence of various draws, by card removal characteristics, or by suits or specific card ranks. Our goal is to use these charts and filters to identify strategies that we can apply to the broadest group of hands possible because, as we've discussed, this simplifies the game. And this concept of starting with the abstract and advancing towards the granular is natural to the human mind and it's how we tend to make sense of a complex world and also how we most efficiently learn intricate subject matters. And this applies to poker strategy as well. Whether players are fully aware of it or not, everyone actually uses bucketing. Outside of a few exceptions, players devise strategies not for specific combinations, but rather for categories of hand classes. For example, in this hand, a player in the hijack isn't going to devise a unique strategy specifically for Ace of Clubs, Queen of Hearts, and then differentiate that strategy with how he would play Ace of Clubs, Queen of Diamonds. All players will bucket these hands together in a category or class of hands, such as two overs without a backdoor flush draw, or a strong ace, or ace-queen off, etc, etc. Each person has their own unique way of bucketing hands, but all do it. What distinguishes the top players from beginners is that, just like every other skill or area of learning, Experts will understand and be able to execute on a more granular level compared to beginners who start out at a very abstracted, simplified level. And we believe that poker players should study the same way that they naturally learn and play. So how in practice do we use these filters to move from the abstract to the granular? Well, the reality is users can filter their ranges and create classes in any way that suits them, and the GTOJEC solver allows for tremendous flexibility in this regard. But to assist users with developing a systematic method of reviewing and analyzing hands, the dashboard has been deliberately structured in three levels of decreasing abstraction from top to bottom. The first level is the highest level of abstraction, which we refer to as the macro analysis, and it focuses on the strategies of the overall range. The second level is called the meso-analysis, and it focuses on the strategies for hand classes. And finally, the third and final level is the micro-analysis, which focuses on the strategies for individual combinations. So how do we know when we should be progressing through these levels and moving from an abstract strategy to a more granular one? Well, just like the solver, each and every poker player's sole objective, regardless of whether you're playing live or online, MTT, cash, heads up, or whether you're playing against strong or weak opponents, should be to maximize the number of chips you have at the end of the game. And there's a metric produced by the solver which actually precisely calculates this amount, known as expected value, or EV for short. When a solver simulates a hand, it tracks the number of chips it wins or loses for each trial based on the actions taken during such trial. Expected value measures the average number of chips each action will yield by the end of the game over the course of billions of trials. So the way we decide when we should be refining our abstracted strategy and getting more granular is by focusing on the point when the abstracted strategy starts to lose a significant amount of expected value compared to the optimal strategy. And in the GTO Check Solver, this is measured through EV Regret. Now I've done a separate video on EV and EV Regret, which I will leave a link in the description for, but generally, for each action available to the player to act, EV Regret measures the maximum amount of expected value that player will lose if he chooses to take such action with 100% of the hands within the player's range or class of hands, and this value is standardized by dividing it by the size of the pot. So going back to our example of high jack versus low jack in a 3-bet pot on a king-king jack board, 
we see that the EV regret for the hijack betting each and every single combination in its range quarter pot is zero. This means that no matter which hand the hijack is actually holding, whether it be 4-5 or five of spades, or ace-9 of clubs, or pocket queens, if the hijack simply decide to bet all of these hands quarter pot, his strategy will essentially be in perfect alignment with the solver's optimal strategy. In contrast, on the 8-7-6 board, the EV regret for betting the entire range quarter pot is a whopping 15.3%, meaning that if the hijack decided to bet all of the hands in this range quarter pot in this spot, he will lose a maximum of 2.8 big blinds compared to the optimal strategy, which is quite significant. So in a scenario like this, the idea is that we need to refine our strategy by making it more granular, and we do this by breaking down our strategy into hand classes. And we will continue to break down our range into smaller and smaller pieces, until we reach the point where we find a group of hands which, when we play them the same way, will not result in a significant EV loss compared to the optimal strategy. Now this, of course, raises the question of what constitutes a significant EV loss that should prompt us to drill down to more granularity. Well, this question depends entirely on each individual user, and this flexibility is how GTO Check provides a very elegant solution to the problem that persists with most training materials and tools, which is that they are not customized to each user's individual experience level and ability to absorb information. Since the abstracted strategy is the simplest and the granular strategy is the most complex, beginners should choose a relatively high EV regret threshold, perhaps somewhere around 3%. This allows someone new to GTO to get their feet wet with theoretical concepts without getting inundated with all of the minutia of the solver's intricate strategies. However, if you're a more experienced player, you'll want to set your EV regret threshold lower, perhaps somewhere around 1%. This allows more advanced players to incrementally capture more and more EV from the GTO strategies which will be helpful to gain small edges against tougher opponents who are able to exploit imbalances. And as a player progresses in his knowledge of GTO, he can gradually lower his EV regret threshold in lockstep. One caveat we should note here is that when we bucket hands together, we are potentially running the risk of straying from the optimal frequencies defined by the solver. For example, in certain scenarios, the solver may show one action as having zero EV regret for a class of hands, but the solver is nevertheless splitting its frequencies for such class among multiple actions. This may occur, for example, if there is one or a handful of combos within the class that strictly prefer to take the action with zero EV regret, but the majority of other combos in the class mix between multiple actions. In these sorts of instances, although choosing to take the action that has zero EV regret with all of the combos within the class will not make a player vulnerable against an opponent who himself is playing GTO, this strategy may be exploited by an opponent that is closely tracking frequencies. So in these instances, even if the EV regret for a particular action is low, it may still make sense to refine the class further. So we have now established that we can greatly simplify our learning of GTO by developing overarching strategies that can be applied to broad groups of hands or even our entire range in certain circumstances. But how do we actually execute these strategies when we're sitting at a table without these charts in front of us? Well, as mentioned earlier, it's our philosophy that players should learn poker in the same manner that they play. And so GTO Check's tri-level system is not only a methodology of learning, it also provides a structured way to analyze hands, which focuses us on the most important factors that drive EV maximizing strategies for every single strategic decision at the felt. And for the remainder of this video, we're going to delve into the first, most abstract level, the macro analysis.